Now's the time for all good men to get together with one another. Iron out the problems, iron out the quarrels, and try to live as brothers. Try to find the peace within without stepping on one another. And do respect the women of the world. Remember, you all had mothers. Welcome back to Hun's Healthy Kitchen and the finale of season one of Are We Really What We Eat? We have tackled a complicated subject and our 19 episodes have demonstrated myriad ways we absorb the outside world into our physical and energetic body. We know now, if we didn't know before, that our health and well-being are influenced by far more than what we put directly into our mouths. Tonight, we will open by touching on four more ways to examine the question, are we really what we eat? Because there are brief, these are brief overviews, I've created a PowerPoint, a short one for each. If we do a season two, we will go deeper into each of them. But knowing that some of you may want to learn more now, we're giving you links tonight at the end of each of the PowerPoints. Um, we're going to start with, let me see here for the, oh, so you should know, um, the second, we're going to do four of these and then the second segment we will have, and pardon me if I look at some of my notes, cause this is a lot to cover. Um, three of our great guests are joining us for an informal conversation. I'm excited about that. And I'll tell you more in a minute. And the last segment will be twofold. The first part will be um, an overview of Hun's Convertibles, a creative, easy meal planning strategy I developed when I was a very busy single mom and I had a little daughter, Kiara, um, and was still committed to cooking healthy, real food. And uh, the second part will be, I think appropriately, some teachings from ancient cultures and indigenous peoples that will close the uh, the segment. All the credits, all the wonderful people who have helped make this series possible will be in the closing credits as well. So are you ready? Let's get started. Um, we're going to start with uh, talking about food waste. And um, there is a huge problem with food waste. And there are a lot of things we can do about it. So Let's let's start. Um, ast astoundingly, there are 108 million tons of food wasted each year out of the 429 million tons of food produced. That's as of this year, I believe. Um, that means 30 percent of the food produced is wasted. Another way of saying this is there's two and a half tons of food per person wasted. And of that amount, approximately 40% is from household waste. And we'll talk about that next. Um, there are 40 million food insecure people. So we've got not just an environmental issue with the food wasted, we've got a social issue, uh, a social justice issue. And um, that's 12% of our population that's food insecure. And with two and a half tons of food wasted per person, most of which ends up in landfills, it would be a game changer to reduce food insecurity if we just reduced food waste from households, which is within our control. And then there's the economic issue of food loss and 
food loss and waste totaling 106 billion in 2018. Um, and most of this food that ends up in landfills creates methane gas, which we know is a powerful greenhouse gas. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so 40% of food waste is comes from our own households. And here's the story. And this is a something that really I just learned um, recently. Um, a lot of the problem with the, the tossed out food at home is because of the different categories of things that we do and don't do um, uh, because we believe what's written on the product. Um, the date printed on the product that um, is sell by or best by or use by, you've seen them. And that they're really scary. You think, oh my God, you know, I have 15 cans of soup and, you know, or boxes of soup and products, pretzels, whatever they are, they all have these dates on them. And when you look at, um, you know, then there's 50 at the bottom one on the chart here, when the item doesn't smell, look, or taste right. Well, that, that means we're either buying too much or we've, or something is wrong. But the other, all the other things add up to 46%. So let's move to the next slide, please. So the truth is that only baby food and infant formula are protected by federal law, by the FDA. Um, otherwise, all those dates that are on there, they're marketing gimmicks. Um, stores are afraid of lawsuits, so they either throw the food out, they're afraid to give it to groups, um, to nonprofits, because they're afraid of being sued. But the truth is that store donations are protected by law. There is a Good Samaritan Act. So a lot of what we're doing is really sadly wasted. I tried this myself. I, I had, what was it recently? Um, I think it was a box of a vegetable stock that I was going to, an organic vegetable stock that I was going to use. And it, it, it had, you know, used before this date. And it was after that date. And I just decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to open it up, smell it, taste it. And if it's okay, I'm going to use it. And you know what? It was perfectly fine. And I've done that with other things since. But, you know, it's like you have this irrational fear, but you really don't need to. So I'm hipping you to that, that we're throwing out or giving away um, food that um, is perfectly fine. And we're also spending more money than we need to. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I want to touch on with there. Um, I think we're good on that one. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. What can we do? So, oh, other sources. Well, yes, um, there is a lot of uh, growers who throw food out, if not perfect, because especially um, those, that's been one of the pressures on growers to grow not organically because they think they won't have perfect looking apples or strawberries or whatever the heck they're growing. Um, the fact is that a lot of stores won't take food that's not perfect. And we're also producing more than we need. So let's go to the next slide, please. So what we can each do is buy only what we need. Don't buy too much. Shop more frequently. Um, and that can be a problem for some of us, especially if we're busy. But I think if we plan, we can do it without shopping more frequently necessarily. Um, but buy only what you need. Freeze vegetables or cook them up in some way before they go bad. And um, there's a whole volunteer farm effort of, of harvesters who are called gleaners. And that has created a whole new um, business model of upcycling companies like Imperfect Foods. And I see them deliver here in my neighborhood where the foods that are less than perfect, but perfectly fine and fresh are sold at a lower price. And um, it's a kind of cool business model. So seek those kinds of companies out. Um, yeah, 
And the other thing you can do is to prep your food as soon as you finish your shopping trip and plan what and when you're going to use it so it doesn't go to waste. You can always make soup or a stock and put that in the freezer. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to convertibles in the third segment. And there are some great resources. We're going to watch a trailer. It's just a little over two minutes of a wonderful um, 90 minute podcast on YouTube that I am recommending to you. And there's another resource on there as well. So let's look at that trailer, Jim. I started coming across these numbers about how much is being wasted. And I just thought, how is nobody talking about this? 40% of everything raised or grown is not in fact eaten. If that much food is being wasted, how much of it is still good? And can we eat it? Oh, we're trying to survive off food waste right now. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, you're going to hit the jackpot. I'm starting to enjoy this. Is that cold stuff? Can I buy those bananas? Yeah, you want to buy the bananas? Sure. Yeah, I'm not going to ask for a deal. I'd rather just not draw attention to it. Supermarkets tell you what diameter, length, curvature, all of those parameters have to be exactly right. Our whole fridge is full of stuff that needs to be eaten tomorrow. This is not a lifestyle that I want to continue. Well, neither do I, so let's stop. I don't want to stop because we haven't proved anything yet. Highs and lows of the project, you know? Highs and lows. Mm. This is a high point. This is edible, but it's not edible to the supermarkets. As a grower, that's heartbreaking. When you grow the fruit and you can't sell it, that bothers me. Yeah, this is me every week. You wouldn't want to know how much product we would dispose of. Wasting food is not only widespread, but it's condoned. The scale of the stuff that we've seen so far is pretty shocking, and I think we've only seen like the littlest bit. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on and uh, go into a very different subject, which is kind of interesting. You know, we've been talking in the series about um, what we eat is not just what we put directly into our mouths. And here is a perfect example that um, who knew? We knew the gut is has a microbiome the soil has a microbiome and they're connected but did you know that the skin has a microbiome in fact we carry around two pounds of microbes on our skin each one of us who knew i mean i i really didn't know much about this at all um so let's look at how we absorb the outside world into our physical and energetic body we know it's through the mouth um, for the what we eat and swallow, and it goes through our digestive system. And we've talked some about it goes through our sensory organs, our five senses, the eyes, ears, nose, and skin. And we're really going to focus on skin here. And also our brain. So um, there are three, there are millions of beneficial microorganisms in the skin microbiome. Um, and that is called microbiota, the millions of beneficial microorganisms. And they consist of bacteria, fungi, viruses um, that form the skin's microbiome. Let's look at the next one. Okay, so if we take a little bit closer look, um, the, what does the microbiome do? It's a barrier. It protects us um, from the outside world. It eats the skin. The, we have so many pores on our skin, and and it um, it is not separate from our body. It is a living. They're living, breathing, interconnected ecosystem. And so, whatever our skin eats, inhales, and touches impacts our entire ecosystem. If you look back just for a minute here, on the right side, you'll see a healthy. Um, skin where there is no 
uh, breaks in the skin and so on. We're not going to get into this deeply, but just the, the fact is that it pro provides a very protective barrier here where the skin, where there is a disrupted, disruptive um, skin barrier function, you'll see breaks in the skin and all kinds of, of bad things can get in. Okay, now we can move on to the next slide. So, uh, but micro, the different microbiota um, there are, are live in different parts of the body because we have cooler and drier parts of the body like our arms and legs. We have wetter and moister areas like our armpits, our forehead, our groin area, and there's different amounts of oil in all of these places. So um, the, micro, the, the microbiota will find what is the friendliest, most hospitable um, environment for them and, find, and live there. Um, and that's all designed by nature. This is a closer look, and we're not going to get deep into this, but it's pretty interesting to look at the complexity of the microbiome um, when we look at the thick skin area um, and the thin skin area. So the thinner skin will be, for example, on the forehead, very thin. Um, also the leg, the lower leg, but um, the thicker skin will be, say, the neck or the back, um, all of these will have different effects on the body and uh, affect where the micro, um, where the different viruses and fungi and bacteria like to hang out and do their work. Okay, let's move on. So um, as I say, this is brief, but just to give you a sense that all of this is going on on the skin and it is totally connected to the rest of our energetic and physical body. It's totally connected. It's not by itself separate. And so what we do with our skin, the things we apply to it, the topicals, um, we have to be careful, you know, even outside with all the chemicals being sprayed, you've heard of people being um, deadly, deadly sick from glyphosate. You think about walking around on soil that has been chemically polluted. Um, and the largest pores are on the bottoms of our feet. So think about, think about that and read some here. This is a good little place for you to start. Okay, um, now I'm gonna do something a little different. You know, we've talked about all the different ways that we communicate and interact with our world, all the different living things. And we've talked about the connection that we have with our living world. Um, and some of us, a lot of us, because we used to live, as I've said, in the forest and plains, and we were very connected to all the things going on with our world and with the natural world. And most of us don't live anywhere near um, nature now. We're living in concrete areas, mostly high rises, concrete streets, and and we don't have, we're not surrounded by nature. So um, I wanted to give a little bit of time to a wonderful new book that's a bestseller called An Immense World. It's a New York Times bestseller written by Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist Ed Young. And it is, this book takes us on a voyage that um, Marcel Proust calls the only true voyage, not to visit strange lands, but to possess other eyes. And I'm gonna read you a little bit of the introduction, which is called the only true voyage. And I may stop at certain points, just, you know, if, it's, if I think it's too boring, but it's, he's wonderful. Imagine an elephant in a room. This elephant is not the proverbial weighty issue, but an actual weighty mammal. Imagine the room is spacious enough to accommodate it. Make it a school gym. Now imagine a mouse has scurried in too. A robin hops along side it. An owl perches on an overhead beam. A bat hangs upside down from the ceiling. A rattlesnake slithers along the floor a spider has spun a web in the corner, in a corner. A mosquito buzzes through the air. 
a bumblebee sits upon a potted sunflower. Finally, in the midst of this increasingly crowded hypothetical space, add a human. Let's call her Rebecca. She's sighted, curious, and thankfully fond of animals. Don't worry about how she got herself into this mess. Never mind what all these animals are doing in a gym. Instead, consider how Rebecca and the rest of this imaginary menagerie might perceive one another. The elephant raises its trunk like a periscope. The rattlesnake flicks out its tongue and the mosquito cuts through the air with its antennae. All three are smelling the space around them. The rattlesnake detects the trail of the mouse and coils its body in ambush. The mosquito smells the alluring carbon dioxide on Rebecca's breath and the aroma of her skin. It lands on her arm ready for a meal, but before it can bite, she swats it away and her slap disturbs the mouse. It squeaks in alarm at a pitch that is audible to the bat, <clears throat> but too high for the elephant to hear. The elephant, meanwhile, unleashes a deep thunderous rumble, too low pitched for the mouse's ears or the bats, but felt by the vibration sensitive belly of the rattlesnake. Rebecca, who was oblivious to both the ultrasonic mouse squeaks and the infrasonic elephant rumbles listens instead to the robin, which is singing at frequencies better suited to her ears. But her hearing is too slow to pick out all the complexities that the bird encodes within its song. The robin's chest looks red to Rebecca, but not to the elephant, whose eyes are limited to shades of blue and yellow. The bumblebee can't see red either, but it is sensitive to the ultraviolet hues that lie beyond the opposite end of the rainbow. The sunflower it sits upon has at its center an ultraviolet bullseye, which grabs the attention of both the bird and the bee. The bullseye is invisible to Rebecca, who only thinks the flower is yellow. Her eyes are the sharpest in the room. Unlike the elephant or the bee, she can spot the small spider sitting on its web, but she stops seeing much of anything when the lights go out. Plunged into darkness, Rebecca walks slowly forward, arms outstretched, hoping to feel obstacles in her way. The mouse does the same, but with the whiskers on its face, which it sweeps back and forth several times a second to map its surroundings. As it skitters between Rebecca's feet, its footsteps are too faint for her to hear but they are easily audible to the owl perched overhead. The disc of stiff feathers on the owl's face funnels sounds toward its sensitive ears, one of which is slightly higher than the other. Thanks to this asymmetry, the owl can pinpoint the source of the mouse's skitterings in both the vertical and horizontal planes. It swoops in just as the mouse blunders within range of the waiting rattlesnake. Using two pits on its snout, the snake can sense the infrared radiation that emanates from warm objects. In effect, it sees in heat and the mouse's body blazes like a beacon. The snake strikes and collides with the swooping owl. All of this commotion goes unnoticed by the spider, which barely sees or hears the participants. Its world is almost entirely defined by the vibrations coursing through its web, a self-made trap that acts as an extension of its senses. When the mosquito strays into the silken strands, the spider detects the telltale vibrations of struggling prey and moves in for the kill. But as it attacks, it is unaware of the high frequency waves that are hitting its body and bouncing back to the creature that sent them, the bat. The bat sonar is so acute that it not only finds the spider in the dark, but pinpoints it precisely enough to pluck it from its web. Bye-bye spider. As the bat feeds, the robin feels a familiar attraction that most of the other animals cannot sense. The days are getting colder and it's time to migrate to warmer Southern climates. 
even within the enclosed gym. This is amazing. It's so amazing. The robin can feel Earth's magnetic field and guided by its internal compass, it points due south and escapes through a window. It leaves behind one elephant, one bumblebee, one bat, one rattlesnake, one slightly ruffled owl, one extremely fortunate mouse, and one Rebecca. These seven creatures share the same physical space, but experience in it is wildly and wonderfully different ways. The same is true for the billions of other animal species on the planet and the countless individuals within those species. Earth teems with sights and textures, sounds and vibrations, smells and tastes, electric and magnetic fields, but every animal can only tap into a tiny fraction of reality's fullness. Each is enclosed within its own unique sensory bubble, perceiving but a tiny sliver of an immense world. That gives you a sense. There's more I wanted to read, but I think that's enough. I just maybe say, tell you one more thing. Animals are not just stand-ins for humans or fodder for brainstorming sessions. They have worth in themselves. We'll explore their senses in the book. We'll explore their senses to better understand their lives. The, they, they move finished and complete, gifted with extensions of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices, we shall never hear, wrote the American naturalist, Henry Beston, quote, they are not brethren. They are not underlings. They are other nations caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travails on the earth. <laughs> And, and for the final um, part of this segment, we're going to talk a little bit about climate therapy or ecotherapy. Isn't that a beautiful picture? It's like an embrace. Love it. <clears throat> Once again, um, here we see there really is no separation between the inner and the outer worlds, between personal and planetary health. Whether psychologists and ecologists now see their connection to one another, or farmers show the connection between healthy soil, clean water, healthy humans, and a healthy planet, the underlying truth is that all living things are connected. All living things are energy. And as Clara Favale said so beautifully in, in her biodynamic craniosacral episode, what affects me affects the tree out there, that bird on, on it, and my next door neighbor. Humans are an integral part of the natural world. And in order to maintain our health and the health of the planet, we must know one another, unlock one another's secrets, and respect and honor that knowing. So nature is cheaper than therapy. Now, when we talk, you know, about the wellness equation, there's no question that um, nature is therapeutic for us. And um, the role of, of, of the ancient, the wisdom of ancient peoples um, is, is all about that. Um, they're so they were so connected. They still are so connected. And we will close um, with some of their wisdom. But um, the Greenway book, Restoring the Earth, Healing the Mind, it's interesting. Uh, there's a quote from it. It's what he, he describes as the um, the book is about a tool for understanding the relationship between humans and nature for um, diagnosing what's wrong with it and for paths to healing it. So um, we have a lot of 
anxiety about what's going on in in the world of in the natural world and how much destruction there has been um, by humans. And uh, I mean, just yesterday in the paper, the whole thing about the, the hottest day in the UK and there's now fires there that they'd never had before because of the heat. Um, so there's a lot of anxiety about the um, about what's happening in the natural world and the climate crisis. So um, it's especially important, two things. One is um, nature is therapeutic, but we need to take care of nature. We need to try to repair uh, because it's, um, Otherwise, we won't we won't have it. Um, and that's yeah. And and there yeah. So I think um, what studies show it's really interesting. Just seventeen minutes outside um, each day can uh, help heighten your mood, your focus, your sleep, and even sex drive. And there were some studies done. I didn't include the um, the sources here, but. Just for an example, students at the U of M, my old alma mater, experienced 20% better memory after taking a walk through a local park. And you know, when we talk to Shelley Galloway in a little while, you will see that, um, I mean, she will talk more about it, but Shinrin Yoku or forest bathing is um, one of the great ways that we can do this. People in Japan were 55% more relaxed after spending the weekend in the forest and 23% more relaxed for the next month even though they were no longer walking in the forest further, you know, that, that month. Um, just direct exposure to sunlight can increase libido by as much as 40%. And who doesn't want to increase their libido? Do I hear anybody? Um, hikers at UC Berkeley had 46% better creative thinking skills after returning from a trek. Um, I think there's no question that our nervous system is downregulated and um, we feel a whole lot better just getting outside and breathing, um, you know, and, and turning off the devices. And uh, there is a book um, that's a very interesting little journal that Patricia Hosback wrote, and it's new, called Grounded. I thought you might be interested in it because it's another way we can re reconnect in, uh, with the power of nature and with yourself. It's that, again, it's that connection between nature and human and understanding and just appreciating all the different things we find outside and stuff. It's a fun little journal. I bought it myself. So that's where we'll end um, this segment. And I am excited to introduce um, our three guests who are joining us today. Again today, they um, Joe Thompson, was with us for episodes one and two. And um, I'm just looking for my, yeah, too many papers. And uh, and then there, uh, Joe has 35 years experience in planning and implementing conservation and environmental. Where is Joe? There he is. Hi, Joe. Hi, hon. Great to be with you again. You too. Um, and you've done a heck of a lot over your life, and it's been very consistent. Um, but I'll, I'll brag a little bit about you, okay? Yeah. Um, planning and implementing conservation and environmental restoration programs. Um, Joe is currently the board chair for the Thomas Jefferson Soil and Water Conservation District and the Thomas Jefferson Water Resources Protection Foundation. Uh, Joe also advises and facilitates production and distribution of grains from local growers and organic, of course, and for 30 years served on the USDA Natural Resources and Conservation Service in four states, in California, Nevada, Oregon, and of course, Virginia. So, um, yeah. So, you know, Joe, um, you were kind enough when we started the series to provide the foundational information and perspective um, that only you would have working with protecting soil, water, wildlife on the West and the East Coast with, with ranchers and farmers. Um, and I'm wondering what you, what, however you wanna comment about what we just 
those four segments we talked about or, um, you know, whatever, how more we could help and get involved with our local organizations that are trying to protect land and water and so on. Sure. Um, a couple of things <laughs> uh, really struck me. One, the food section, the food waste section at the beginning, um, yeah. there wasn't any discussion of composting, which I thought would be a good addition. Um, it's at least a way to be sure that the food that is not consumed gets utilized and cycled back into the system to produce more food. Yeah. Uh, but definitely we're right as far as the amount of it. I, when I was working in California, um, one of the areas I was responsible for oversight in was the San Joaquin Valley, which is probably one of the most amazing places in the world uh, for food production 12 months out of the year. Hmm. And to see Where's that, Where, which part of California is that? Um, that is south of San Francisco between the coast and the Sierra Mountains. Um, it's the main valley there. And there's um, Fresno is at the south end of it. Okay. And it's just just incredible to see you know, the volume. And it's primarily um, vegetables and fruits uh, because the ground is... Big tomato area, right? Big tomato area also, yeah. yes. Um, but to, uh, as you noted... Uh, there at the very beginning of the production process, uh, particularly in conventional agriculture, there's tons of food that's just left on the ground or on the vine or in the trees. And so the gleaning project, which is something actually, first time I was in contact with that was 40 years ago in Oregon. Wow. Um, and it's been around a long time. It is a great, great way to retrieve um, and utilize you know, right from the very beginning, food that's not going to make it into the markets, um, which yeah. is, you know, high quality, ready to go. So so that that was interesting to me on that part, brought back some interesting memories for me. And, um, and the composting part of it, we're really lucky here in the city of Charlottesville because composting is really simple. Uh, we have a local center that uh, is operated for recycling, but also for compost. And they supply compostable bags that you can utilize in your containers uh, to put your food scraps in and make sure at least it's making it that far. Um, do, you know they, what the, do you know, excuse me, but do you know the link to that or the name of it? So I uh, it's the McIntyre Recycling Center. If you just, um, you know, put that in either Google Maps or um, Google itself. Okay. The McIntyre Recycling Center. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a great one for you know people in this area to be able to utilize, and it can be you don't have to live in the city um, if it's within convenient driving distance. You can you know take it there. Okay. Um, and so that or you know composting yourself is relatively simple, particularly if you have any space at all. Um, it's a simple process. It's a very natural. In Manhattan or the the green markets, which are the farmers markets here. Um, uh, they have a recycling place, so anybody who wants to go to the green market can bring their stuff, and they'll take their their composting stuff, which is another good way. The farmers market would be a good place to collect. Yeah, and they do at the Saturday markets here in town too. They do. Okay. Yes. Um. So that is another option. That's a good okay. point. Good. Um. So so that that aspect, and I think it's a really important one, particularly the expiration date uh, discussion. Um. I had picked up on that. Fortunately, I had heard an individual speak and address that about seven or eight years ago. And it is a real eye opener to realize that those dates aren't there to actually protect your health. Right. Um, more about marketing. Um, so it's a, a real good piece of information to share with people. Uh, the, other, the other thing that struck me relative to two things, one kind of the, the very end of the presentation, talking about the trauma or depression associated with, you know, the condition of the earth right now, what's going on. In a rather jaded way, um, I have total comfort with it because I understand that we can disappear as a species. The earth is going to go on. We may leave it in rough shape, but it started out in rough shape. <laughs> and so it will have no problem at all cycling back through and creating you know, new species uh, of plants, insects, animals, and maybe even primates, who knows. 
but we may not be part of that. And I guess that's really the, the question is, will we as a species cho cho choose um, to remain as residents on this planet um, and functional here? And relative to that, the idea of, which is in some ways shocking to me, but it's just the reality of the world we live in, because as you pointed out, the majority of our population is now urban. Um, and the fact that people need to be instructed on how to relate to nature um, is, is shocking to me. But again, given you know where we are right now socially and just demographically, um, it's totally understandable. But it's amazing one of the, the things, which I'm sure is in one of the books, um, that people can do that will just be incredible for them is to take their shoes and socks off and just stand on a piece of earth. And I don't care where it is, um, even if it's, you know, in the middle of a parking lot and it's a strip where there's some trees, just putting your feet on the earth itself um, does amazing things for you as far as reconnection to, you know, where we came from as a species. And that's why it is so important and why it feels so good to get back connected to it. Because the frequency, our frequency, um, without the devices, but our natural frequency is the same as that of the earth. Exactly. So and it makes total sense. That's where we came from. Right, exactly. <laughs> so if we put our feet and we're grounding, we're earthing, you know, it has got names now, but it's just right. makes common sense, right? It does. And then, you know, along the same lines, it was interesting, you know, the, and it sounds like a great book on the sensing that uh, various species have. And, and we have lost the, some of that because if you read old journals, um, particularly ones written by Western Europeans when they came to North America, they talk about the fact that uh, the Native Americans that were here, the people, the nations that were here, um, those individuals had much, much finer sense of smell. I mean, they could track animals by sense of smell. Yeah, yeah. Um, same way with hearing. Uh, the hearing was much more acute and vision. And it's because they lived in the natural world and didn't have artificial noises that skewed their ability to hear and understand what was going on around That's them. Great point. Yes. And, and so we do, as, as a species ourselves, have much more potential than what we currently can get in touch with. Yeah. You know, I mean, people talk about we only use a minute part of our brain and it's the expression use it or lose it. You know, mm -hmm. those exactly. are mind right away talking about that. Exactly. So that and then, you know, just for myself, um, I, I've just been incredibly fortunate because from the time I was very young, I always was, you know, wandering around outside. Um, it was the last place I wanted to be was stuck inside a building <laughs> and ended up with a, with a uh, job that allowed me to do a lot of that and see just some incredible um, different scenarios in nature. I mean, everything from extreme high elevations where at first glance, it looks really barren, but when you start looking close, incredible life forms that are transforming, you know, stone into earth. Um, and a lot of species that make, you know, that their, that's their habitat. And yeah. everything from that down to the desert itself. Um, I went to school in the, the low desert and people in asked me, well, Where'd in New find? Mexico, Southern New Mexico. Oh. And people asked me, well, they come and visit, they say, well, there's nothing there, you know, how can you possibly <laughs> enjoy it? And I said, well, you just need to slow down um, and really look. Open and, your eyes and settle to your senses. And exactly. And yeah. it's as, just as rich as it is in, you know, the most biodiverse jungle habitats um, yeah. once you really get attuned to it. So it's just that, that, you know, all these, you know, areas on this planet have all these species, you know, which was brought out again in the book on senses that have all evolved to utilize, you know, the area that they're lo physically located in yeah. and adapt by mod modifying their senses and their abilities to fit, fit into a niche um, that interplays with all the others. Uh, and that's, that's the other part of it is just, you know, really grasping what's been known for quite a while that 
it is all connected. Um, we're connected and we're not any, really not that much of a, a different than the other species you talked about in that scenario in the gym. Yeah. Um, and we have our own niche, we have our own way of sensing, we have our own way of surviving. The big difference, of course, is um, we have the potential to pretty much destroy um, the earth as we know it, and it would have to more or less start over again yeah. uh, with that capacity. But we also have just the inverse, the ability to figure out how to live uh, you know, more of a modern uh, life and do that in a way that's totally attuned to the energy sources that are here um, and not impacting them negatively at, at all. Uh, and that's why we use that term, you know, reusable or renewable or um, because they really are. Yeah. I mean, as, as long as that big star keeps shining on this planet, we've got all the energy we need and that energy gets expressed in a lot of different ways. Um, yes. It's just a matter of tapping into that. And, and you're and you're one of the stars that shine brightly here. So um, I thank you're you. very kind. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You you've lived you've walked the walk. You know, in your bare feet on the soil, on the earth, and and you're doing that. So and you've been doing it for years. So um, we always can learn more from you and um, the folks like you who. Uh, we're gracious enough to be part of the series. And I just hope that we can make somewhat of a difference. And um, I appreciate your support. If you want to hang here while I introduce um, Jan, uh, that would be cool. I mean, if you want to participate, you're welcome to. It's up to sure. you. Yeah. I'll, just, I'll just stay on the side. And, you know, if. Uh, Jim will keep you on. Let's bring Jan on. There you go. Hey, Jan. Hi there. Jan, um, do you mind if I just did there, uh, Joe, to Jan Wolf. Hey, Joe. Nice to meet you, Jan. Nice to meet you, too. Uh, so Jan, um, her background is as a family nurse practitioner, Reiki master, clinical herbalist, owner of the Elderberry, which is an herbalist, wonderful herbalist shop in Charlottesville. And uh, Jan has an organic herb garden which supplies many of the tinctures, extracts, and teas in her shop. And she's really um, great to talk to. And uh, we loved having her. She was, Joe was episodes one and two, and uh, Jan were episodes five and six. Yeah. So at that time, Jan, it was April or so, or May, and we were talking about what was going on in your garden um, in at that time. And if you want to tell us about what's going on now, but first, if you wanted to interact with anything Joe mentioned or anything, were you there for for the um, the four subjects that we that we talked about? Yes. yes. So anything you want to talk about, I'm very flexible and open to whatever. Well, when it was interesting, Joe, when you were talking, because um, Kat Meyer, who's one of the local herbalists, is doing a workshop the end of this month in Sage Mountain in Vermont, which is Rosemary Gladstars, who's like one of the grandmothers of the American herbal movement, is having a workshop about medicine of place. And mm -hmm. so she has like a botanical sanctuary up there, which is filled with medicinal plants. And the whole weekend's going to be spent about being aware, how to be aware, how to communicate with plants, how to be, how to observe um, different things. Um, and so it's, more on like an energetic, I don't want to say spiritual, but it's it's something that Native Americans or indigenous peoples around the world would really, really be very familiar with their local, you know, um, flora, because that's how they use their medicine and their food. And so they were very attuned to the seasons and how things changed and when it was time to harvest and when it was not, when it was time to plant. So um, when you were talking about that, I said, yeah, that really, that really makes sense. So, um, so this what, time of year, is she, is she, is, is this, um, open to anyone or is it just open to clinical herbalists? No, I think it's open to anyone. And um, it's Rosemary Gladstar? Rosemary Gladstar and it's Sage Mountain and it should be next week. And I don't have more information than that, but, um, look it up. I'm sure. Kat, Kat Meyer on Sacred Plant Traditions website will have information about it since she's one of the people that's teaching there. 
Okay. Um, uh, you know, all ancient peoples were in tune with um, the cycles because they depended on it. Yeah. Agriculture was, um, it was all done by hand. It was all done by feel. I mean, that's why, you know, who was it? The Mayans are supposedly, you know, knew this thousands of years ago. And I'm sure ancient Israelites did and all the ancient peoples. Yeah. Um, their calendars were based on agriculture because, and the holidays, because they were so grateful and thankful, the, you know? Yeah, it's just that, that whole big difference between, you know, living continually outside, what we call outside, yeah. what to them was their world. Yeah. And it was just like we know where a doorknob is um, <laughs> in our house. I mean, really, they yeah. knew, you know, they could look at the sky and they could tell you exactly where they were relative to either their village or where the hunting grounds were or where the water was or anything else without looking at anything else because it was just, from the time you were born on, um, you were attuned to that. And we could rely on the farmer's almanac much better than these weather forecasters sitting, <laughs> in some, right? I mean, that was the real deal. These guys are sitting in God knows where. <laughs> far removed. What do they know? Right. Yeah, they were very attuned to like the clouds and the winds and things. And they could go and get a good sense of what's coming next. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so right now, as and I've noticed it because the, I've been gardening in my area for like the last 20 years and I've been keeping little notes about when I planted something, when it when it came up, when it was harvesting. And I've noticed even in the past 20 years that the um, that I'm having to plant a little bit sooner because it's getting warmer sooner and mm -hmm. that the summers are getting much hotter. So some of the plants that like sort of a cool thing are stopping their production earlier than they used to because it's too much heat. Um, so I can just see that in the past 20 years. Like for instance, like calendula, which is a wonderful herb for, um, it's very soothing. You can use it topically, you can use it internally and it's very sensitive to coolness. And it used to be able to, I could harvest it up to the end of July here. And now mm -hmm. I'm lucky if I can really harvest it much past the beginning of July, just because the days get so hot. Yeah. Um, Good. And this, this year has been a little off because it's been a little bit more overcast and rainy, but the last several summers, July and August have been really hot and dry. Mm -hmm. So um, even I can see this little change in the past, um, you know, past two decades. Yeah. yeah I've noticed that um, elevation wise when I hike that the spring flowers are coming sooner at higher elevations. Um, yeah. That's that same phenomena. Uh, and it's it's very clear, and very definite. And uh, unfortunately or fortunately, it's just evolution. Um, I would guess over time, just like with the plants in the garden, there'll be some things that you won't even be able to grow without creating an artificial environment. And there'll be certain plants that <clears throat> no longer exist in different parts of the mountains here because it'll become too warm for them. Yeah. Yeah. And the... Um the Blue Ridge and the Shenandoah have been, and the Appalachian area has been home to like black cohosh and blue cohosh and all these mm -hmm. wonderful herbs that are becoming more um, difficult to get and more expensive because they're, it's changing. A combination mm -hmm. of their habitat being destroyed, but also the climate and trying to keep up with that. So um, it's interesting that some of the herbs we order have really gone up in price Mm. And it's because they're getting harder to find. And some of them we can try to cultivate, but there have been some concerns that the cultivated versus the wild form has not quite the same amount of yes. constituents and stuff in it. Because um, some of these plants like really crappy soil um, mm -hmm. and like to heart, like to stress a little bit because that gets their, you know, constituents to really going. And mm -hmm. if you plant them and you're giving them all the stuff they need, they don't have that stressing. So some of their components, the percentages of them aren't as much as they used to be because they're adapting to, you know, where they're being planted and stuff. So what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about yeah. the, yeah, stress being um, a part of an important part of, of um, the survival ability of strength. You know, if we're not used to any stress, we're like, we don't cope well. 
Right. Where's the resilience? So yeah, exactly. um, <laughs> where's that going? Yeah. But, um, so, yeah. So, uh, so I have noticed that, but all things being equal this summer, we've gotten a lot of rain, um, yeah. which is pretty good on one hand, but then there are some plants that really like the dry heat and they're not doing as well. So mm -hmm. things like rosemary or lavender, which really are more, um, they grow well more out in California, which is more, what I want to say, what's that climate? Um, it's a little bit drier. Hotter. Yeah, really. yeah. yeah. And they're yeah. just not, the humidity is just not working for them. And um, like sage, for instance, like the official um, salvia officinalis, which is like the official sage, doesn't have the big fat leaves like the um, German sage does, which you see more for culinary. I mean, you can use both of them for culinary, but the German one has the big fuzzy sort of whitish gray leaves. Mm -hmm. But um, it is, and I have it even planted against a brick wall to keep the heat on it, to dry it out with the rains. And even then it's starting to get mildew and stuff and the leaves are starting to blacken in that. But my other sage, the official sage, that thing is a, Energizer Bunny. It can be overwatered, it can be underwatered, and it just keeps going. Now it may shed its leaves a few times, but it's still coming right back. Whereas the other one is just like sort of giving up the ghost right now. Mm -hmm. so, um, so some of these plants are having to kind of uh, not mutate, but they're having to adjust, adapt to the changes, and some of them won't make it, and some of them will do okay, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah. evolution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I kind of uh, coming from the West Coast uh, and wanting to grow lavender and a lot of herbs at our farmhouse. The front garden is all herbs. And what I did was I put down a mat over the soil and filled that entirely with uh, pebbles. Pebbles. And then yeah. I planted those herbs. And between the reflected heat and retained heat off that stone, and the reduction in humidity because you don't have the exposed moist soil. Um, most of them have been really happy and do just fine all through the rain too. I'd, I'd like to bring modify in modify the environment. I'd, yeah, this is a great conversation. I think that um, Shelly will add to it. She's a great floral designer, uh, award-winning Ikebana and and floral designer, and she is a certified um, Shinrin Yoku. Hi, hi there, How are you? <laughs> Shelly. Uh, and she is a certified Shinrin Yoku forest uh, bathing guide. Um, and uh, she's a visual artist and photographer, and she lectures around the country and teaches Ikebana and floral arts in the semester at sea program as well. So Shelly, meet Jan and Joe. Hey. It's nice, nice to meet you, you Shelly. Yeah. Nice to meet yeah. you. Yeah. So I, I was resonating with a lot of the things, particularly Joe was talking about slowing down and I just did a summer reunion with the Shimron Yoku guides from around the area. And slowing down is always something that we need to practice. I think we're, we're too busy racing from thing to thing. And, and I'm really good at the racing and trying to get too many things done. Me too. <laughs> so um, I was talking to Honey a little bit and just said that I came into one of our guided um, invitations. We, we go for a walk. You'll see in our video that you go for a walk and there are invitations and you can choose to do them or not. And definitely you're supposed to be, you know, focusing on your relation, bringing your senses into the place, into nature and, and experiencing what the forest has to say to you. And so I was on one of these first invitations that's called What's in Motion? And you're just supposed to walk very slowly at your own pace, but slow, very slow. And just see what you see that's in motion. And obviously, you're not supposed to be looking at your phone or, or <laughs> listening to anything. <laughs> and I just happened to notice that I was getting these updates about my son's apartment search. And I was kind of anxious about it and having a little trouble grounding myself until I started noticing that everything I was looking at was a home. The, the tree stump was cut and, and there were all the wonderful tree rings, but in the center was this hollow space that was a home. And then there was a children's little 
log cabin that they could go and do nature play in. Well, that was a home. And then the hollow of the tree was a different kind of home. And the anthills were homes and the bird's nests were homes. And I thought, you know, they might not all be the perfect size, the perfect shape, you know, but they work. And each one of those creatures, beings, was making that home their home. And so I took a deep breath and I said, you know, the forest is giving me an answer here. Just know that a home will be provided in some form. And so, you know, Shimrin Yoku is about opening yourself to nature and it's about developing a reciprocal relationship. And the second invitation on that walk was to look at our own skin, which is actually a home of a kind as well and notice the whorls on our fingers. And then take a walk and look for beings and try to relate you know, our physicality to the beings that we're seeing in the forest. And I started noticing bark and all of the different kinds of bark. Well, the bark itself is a home <laughs> because it provides homes for all the creatures, but itself is a skin. And each skin is uniquely suited to the creature, the tree that is within that skin. And some people have eczema, some people have dry skin, some people have oily skin, but the trees also have their skin. And that's another kind of home. So the whole walk was about home. <laughs> so even these silly messages that I could get from the outside world kind of filtered into the forest and I was able to let that go and, and relate, which was wonderful. So um, that was just my little story from last week. But I thought Joe's comment about slowing down was really important. And both of you talked about, you know, the, the first peoples in our world and the first peoples everywhere. And when I do a Shinrin Yoku walk, I sometimes talk about basic that this has gone, and we all talked about, this goes back to the beginning of time. And even in my ancestral culture, Norse culture, Yggdrasil was the cosmic ash tree. And nothing could exist without its relationship to Yggdrasil. And if if they lost connection, similar to the, in the movie Avatar, if you disconnected, you couldn't survive. And Native peoples everywhere really knew that. I mean, Shintoism in Japan is all about the kami spirits that inha inhabit all creatures, all sentient beings, whether they're right. rocks or acorns yes. or... So those were just thoughts I had. And I thought your little story about all the different creatures and how they experience the world through their own filter and their own senses was very interesting and helpful. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, there was just so much of that. I, I really can't wait to read the whole book because it's just filled with, you know, it's it's just I, I smile every time, you know, and I, it's, just with, it's such wonder and amazement at, you know, there are creatures with eyes like a scallop has thousands of mm -hmm. eyes all around its shell. Mm -hmm. you know, like, just that alone is staggering, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I loved your talk, Jan, about all the herbs because at the end of our uh, Shimrin Yoku walk, we always have a tea ceremony, which isn't like the Japanese tea ceremony. It's it's a way to come together in a circle and share the experience and bring closure. And it's it's about gathering tea plants locally and then making them into the tea. I'm lucky I have um, anise hyssop in my front yard. Yeah. And I just... I love that. And we had, uh, you were talking about plants that struggle to survive. And we, the one tea that we had this week, she called it a pineapple plant. And it grows oh. in disturbed soil. And it, it, it has a little kind of a, a dome shaped. Sounds like chamomile. It looks like chamomile and it might be in the chamomile family. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it likes disturbed soil and it often grows in parking lots in the gravel. Huh. And we, we had a tea made out of that and it was just delicious. Wow. So sometimes, you know, 
the plants you least expect to provide you with a flavor are there for for the sampling if you was it nope. flowers or leaves or it was leaves and then this little dome cone shaped center of the plant oh. i don't i have it written down but i don't have my notes in front of me but okay. she did call it pineapple plant send it send it and then i'll okay. pass it along yeah because sometimes the common names for things if you i know go to a different state they'll have it's a totally different plant exactly um well, and this lady yeah was from California. So, but she leads walks everywhere. I'll just have to, I'll put it, if I find it while we're still on, I'll post it in our chat. Okay. Yeah. Don't look at your phone though now. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm not going to. <laughs> so any questions from any of you? I mean, you all have your own area of expertise and I'm, I'm just really just certified in this. So yeah, um, you've been doing ikebana and flowers and right, and it's interesting. I'm I'm doing a photography show, which is all it's titled kintsugi, which is uh, another Japanese art form where you take a broken uh, broken ceramic, usually a tea uh, cup, yeah. and if it's broken, you you heal it back with gold leaf. So that the healed wow. object is more beautiful and more whole than it was wow. before it was broken. So my whole show is about is is more a it's more of a metaphor. It's about healing and self acceptance. And I have found the Shimron Yoku practice to be really essential because if you walk in the forest, the plants and the animals and beings are not judging you or determining what you should or should not be doing. It's a an open dialogue. So I've found it to be very helpful in that sense. Yeah, that whole concept of, of an open dialogue when you're walking in a natural setting really relates a lot back to um, the original approach uh, that hunter-gatherers had with hunting. Mm -hmm. um, as you, you know, move through the environment you end up with uh, an inner relationship with the prey that you know mm -hmm. you're trying to take for sustenance, and the ability to one see motion and to have motion is really critical. Um, mm -hmm. I've had the experience of being within ten feet of a full-grown cow elk, which probably mm -hmm. weighed 250 pounds, 300 pounds easily, and not seeing it until its ear flicked. Wow. The entire animal. Wow. Um, and it's the same way with they, when they observe us, but it's that, that same thing. And then for the hunters originally, it was then interacting with that animal and getting acceptance of the fact that they were going to give their life in order for right. you to live. Right. Um, so it was, it was, it's a, it's a really interesting concept that's i think really hard for a lot of people in modern the modern world to even begin to grasp that there's that kind of interrelationship um between humans and the uh their sources of food mm -hmm. originally yes. and it, one thing i learned last week that i really had not realized um there are certain communities of people that are not comfortable going in the forest and that is trauma-informed by where they grew up, how they were raised, what fears they had. Um, you know, in the South, young black men were cautioned from by their families not to wander into the woods, you yeah. know, and that's hopefully passed, but not necessarily. And mm -hmm. so they need to approach Shimon Yoku differently, and we need to understand that. Um, one woman that I was sending on an invitation, told me, I said, um, we were near a sensory bed where there were lots of fragrances. And I said, you know, wander along the bed and perhaps you might want to touch the plants and see what fragrance you, you know, you acquire on your hand and then bring to your nose. And what memory does that bring to you? And she said, oh no, you can't do that with my community because fragrances can be very traumatic. And that was a great learning experience for me because I would have to rephrase that invitation. 
and maybe just talk about, you know, find a fragrance that you relate to as your personal perfume or gather a fragrance and share it with your partner, but maybe not relating it to a memory because I guess some fragrances can be pretty emotional for people. And I hadn't really thought of it that way. So, you know, I'm learning something new each time I go out with a group of people. You know, um, I, I hate to uh, I, I hate to cut this conversation off. It just seems so organically flowing. Um, but I'm I'm supposed to end at eight thirty, and um, I still have to cover some of of um, other stuff. So I I wish um, <laughs> I'd like to have a redo, a retake, and just keep going because uh, I really like where this conversation is going and has been, it has its own, it has its own path, right? Yeah. So um, thank you so much, each of you, Shelly, Jan, Joe. Um, and I, I, if you can stick around, I would love that. Um, and um, what can I say? Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's kind of, um, it's, it's a non sequitur to say we're going to have a completely other thing, but um, they were wonderful. Uh, talking a little bit about, oh, thank you, Willie. Ah, oh, my friend is watching from New York City. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about Huns Convertibles, which is, uh, isn't that a great El Dorado? caddy. Um, whether the top, car's top is up or down, whether it's red, yellow, tan, or black, whether there's just the driver or the driver and several passengers, whether it has a GPS, a stereo system or not, well, of course, the caddy predated that. This car still runs and goes to the destination set forth by the driver. So the same goes with us drivers in the kitchen. We have many options as to where we can go with something as simple as a can of beans. We can go around the corner or to Paris, Istanbul, or Athens using special ingredients and seasonings. We're the driver and it's up to us which of the hundreds of menu items we wanna transform that can of beans into. As long as we're driving, we decide and that's the fun of it. The only limitation is our imagination, what we've stocked in our fridge, freezer, and pantry, and maybe any dietary restrictions. So um, if we move to the second slide now, a good analogy for having a fun kitchen experience when cooking at home is like an artist's studio. You'd never think of an artist's studio without all the colors, the brushes, chalks, canvases, pencils, easels, cloths, smocks, containers for mixing, tape, paint remover, all of that. Well, the same thing goes with a properly stocked kitchen. You can't expect to be creative, have fun, and get things done quickly without waste if you don't have what you need in there uh, to, to cook with and when you need it. So these ground rules are here to guide you like a roadmap for your convertibles, whatever colors you choose. Um, and for cooking at home to be your best friend, it should be easy, creative, delicious, and fun, reduces food waste, be okay with your budget, organize and simplifies weekly meal planning, and you control uh, where you get your food and how fresh it is. And uh, this works, this method works, whether you live alone or whether you're part of a family or a group. Um, so that's where to start. With, with convertibles, what I do is I have three main convertible base groups. And um, we'll talk about those in a minute. And then, uh, then we review and select from a bunch of recipe categories, which I have, 
and then we make a weekly meal plan. But first we check the fridge, freezer and pantry inventories. Then we make the meal plan and then we make a shopping list. So the recipe categories, you know, I just did this because sometimes when you're thinking about making a meal plan, it's hard enough thinking, what am I gonna buy? You know, so I think it helps to have these categories. Um, and of course there could be others too, but this is just, you know, a good place to begin. There's a lot of here, uh, wraps and sandwiches. Of course that includes paninis, tacos, burritos, all of that's in one egg dishes, which is quiches, um, omelets, frittatas, you know, veggie burgers, soups and bisques, stews, chilies, casseroles, and then all the other things. And of course, there's lots of savory pastries too, like the Salvadorian pastries and the Chinese um, and the Japanese uh, dumplings of, of different ethnic groups. And then you can make bowls. Bowls are a fun thing, kind of like the overnight oats idea, making a whole bunch of stuff in a jar. And you make a bowl, which is a salad with all kinds of other stuff. And then we go on to the flavor profiles. And here, this is the palette, you know, I love this. Because you start with your family and what you know, and then you can go anywhere in the world with the stuff that you like. The important thing with all of this though, is what do you have in your, if we move on to the next one, um, the next critical steps is finding one day a week when it's best to, for you to shop and prep and then selecting the vegetables um, for your plan. And then I would suggest that you try to buy bulk grains, beans, nuts and seeds, dried fruits, whatever you can, because usually the prices are less. And um, before you leave the market, double check and make sure you got everything on your list. I'm a big, um, yeah, I often leave the market and say, oh my God, I forgot to get this one thing on there. And then prep the best, I think that the easiest way is when you get home to prep the vegetables as you unpack and store them. Like if you get corn with the husk, um, shuck the ears and put them in the fridge. Um, if you're getting um, carrots, maybe you want to prep them in sticks and, you know, jicama, whatever things like that to make it easier, celery. So you don't have, you get some of the prep stuff done. I get uh, my salad that's already washed and prepped and I transfer it from the plastic into another kind of container that lasts longer and doesn't take as much room in the fridge. Any kind of prepping you do and if you can earmark what you're prepping for certain dishes, that helps too. Um, this is just a simple little idea I wanted to give you. If you're using canned beans and don't have time to make uh, beans from scratch, this is a way to make them more versatile, more flavorful, and they keep longer. You marinate them. So um, these are the instructions, very simple. And um, the, the tip there is when you, when you coat the herbs and aromatics in vinegar and olive oil, um, it prevents oxidation, which means they will last longer, which is cool. And then you can just take them out and spoon them onto a salad or put them into a, as part of your wrap or whatever. So it's, they're good to have. Um, my, my veg, my um, base convertibles are either beans, vegetables, or grains, those three. So I pick two out of the three for the week. And, um, if for beans, if I don't have time, I'll just make sure I get for this menu that I'm going to give you a sample menu, which is really just, I took a stab at it because I thought it might be useful, but really it's your choice. When you go into your kitchen, it's um, you're the chef, you make what's good for you and uh, what you like. And so with vegetables, I either... I always make in bulk. There are always enough for three or four meals, um, depending on how many people in your family, but that's really what you, you wanna have enough so that you're not cooking every day. You're trying to simplify your life. So I either stir fry or I roast. Um, and you know we don't have time to go into that now, but 
one of the things I was thinking about, if any of you would be interested, we can do like a three, four um, session just on convertibles and weekly meal planning and making it fun and coming up with really good recipes for making some of these things. But um, make I make a grain medley every week and I make at least one vegetable stir fry, if not two, with different vegetables. So I'm getting a variety of grains and vegetables. And beans, if I don't have time, I will um, just open a can and then I will use them in such a way that they get flavor and sometimes use the liquid in there. You can, um, if you're a vegan, you already know this, but there's something called aquafaba. You can whip it up like whipped cream and uh, it's, it's fascinating. But that bean liquid turns into like a cream um, that you can use in different ways for desserts and for savory. Um, so I pick out the stir fry vegetables. I'm going to make my list. Um, if I don't have, I check my pantry, my fridge and my freezer first. If I don't have enough, I, I buy grains and I buy enough that I store in, in jars so that I have enough for at least a month. Um, and I will buy four cans of beans, two different kinds or three different, whatever you want. Um, I'll buy them. Then I'll buy salad fixings and sauces and dressings if needed. Um, make sure I have enough of my avocado oil for um, high temp cooking and extra virgin olive oil, which is EVOO. Um, I make sure I have my sprouted grain, uh, whole wheat muffins or tortillas, avocado or guacamole, hummus, veggie stock, eggs, or vegetable protein that substitute for eggs like tofu and tempeh, and seasonal fruits um, and bananas. Um, I always have enough of those on hand, and that's my my prep. Um, this is a simple a sample meal plan, and I will send that to you along with this. You know, it doesn't make sense to me to go into it all. But I think that I would love to send it to you just so you can see it. Um, and, and then you can write me with any questions. And um, I will send you that. And I will send you my recipe for my sweet potato black bean veggie burgers that are vegan and no oil. Um, you can do it either way. But um, there's the rest of it. That's my Friday night dinner. Um, just giving you some ideas. And... Um, I wanted to tell you, yes, so before we go to the, um, the closing part of, of this, uh, hour and a half we have, we're getting kind of close. I wanted to ask you, you know, I, I wanted to send you the sample meal plan and also um, a recipe for my veggie burger. Um, but I, I have one thing to ask you in return. And that is if you would complete a little questionnaire, a survey about what you liked best about this series. Um, and if you would also um, like to see a season two and if you would like me to do a cooking series if you'd like to do more on convertibles or whatever you know whatever your ideas are i'd love to hear them and uh, and then you send them to me at honeypeacock at gmail and i will send you um the the sample meal plan and the recipe um so let's just move into this last part. Um, I opened the series expressing gratitude for all of you who cared enough to who supported me to make this project happen. And um, as we close, I want to once again thank you, each of you who care enough about our planet and who are trying to make it a better place for all of us to thrive in community. And I give special gratitude to our natural world for bearing with us humans and the errors of our ways. May we do better tomorrow 
and the day after. It seems fitting to give the final word of the evening to the ancient cultures and indigenous people of the world who continue to have the closest connection to mother nature, who understand her secrets and who have so much to teach us. We leave you this evening with 10 indigenous teachings. Good evening and onward. Let us celebrate life and health. Jim, will you help me with the affirmations? Would you start, please? We'll each read one. Jim is our technical producer and he's been fabulous. And as for the other, the gratitude to my team and to all the, the key people and to each of our guests, they will be in the closing credits. They each deserve a special mention. There's Jim, Jim Spellos. The earth is our mother, care for her. Honor your ancestors through your actions. Open your heart and soul to the great spirit. All life is sacred. Treat all beings with respect. Take from the earth what is needed and nothing more. Put the good of all before your own interests. Give constant thanks for each new day. Speak the truth, but only of the good in others. Follow the rhythms of nature, rise and retire with the sun. That's going to be the hardest for me. Enjoy life's journey, but leave no tracks. Now's the time for all good men to get together with one another. Iron out the problems, iron out the quarrels, and try to live as brothers. Try to find the peace within without stepping on one another. And do respect the women of the world. Remember, you all have.